Hello and good afternoon. My name's Ian Parker and I'm the Commercial Affiliates Manager for ACE. Now today's session, today's ACE's webinar is about R&D tax credits. And if you're like me and don't know a great deal about R&D tax credits, well, you're very lucky because we do have R&D tax relief specialist, Forrest Brown, to give you all the right uh, answers and maybe even to be able to answer all your uh, awkward questions as well. So they will hope, hopefully, they will be able to give you so, a few insights into the whole concept of R&D tax incentives and explain how the funding continues to support ACE's members, in particular from an, uh, an SME perspective, that's particularly important. And I know that quite a lot of you will be already involved in um, making sure that uh, you utilize uh, R&D tax credits and how it plays a vital role in strengthening your business. And it's great that you're actually doing that. However, I'm also aware that there'll be quite a few of you that perhaps are not too sure about how it all works. And so for those of you, if you like me as well, then you've come along to the right place and hopefully you'll, you'll learn more and get more information out of that. At the end of the presentation that uh, um, our colleagues at Forest Brown will be uh, will be doing today, there'll be a Q and A session, and then hopefully the team will uh, answer any questions uh, uh, that arise from there as well. Um, don't forget, use the, the chat box to put your questions in. You don't have to wait to the very end. You can do that during the course of the presentation, and uh, always remember that. Uh, unless you like to be notified, then your name will be uh, anonymous. Um, don't worry, by the way, if you do miss anything, it won't matter because this will be up on our website in the next couple of days. So if you don't want to listen again, I think you can watch it now, but more importantly, if you do want to listen to it again, because you're not too sure of some of uh, the information that you uh, that you're uh, digesting today, then obviously you'll be able to look at it. But also probably more importantly, I think, is pass it on to your colleagues as well and let them uh, see it also. Now, before we start the presentation, um, one of my colleagues is just gonna flash them up on the screen, which is a poll with a couple of questions on it. It would be good if you'd be able to answer those. And if you do, then we'll be able to share it uh, relatively quickly. So question one, do you currently make use of the R&D tax incentive? Yes or no, or you're not sure. But also, are you aware of HMRC's changing approach to R&D tax credits? This is particularly important because, uh, and I'm sure that uh, our colleagues from Forest Brown will explain in, in more detail, that this could have uh, significant implications in particular to uh, to our SME members. And while you're just finishing that, um, I, I want to um, apologize if I end up in a coughing fit, then that unfortunately is post-COVID symptoms. Um, I had COVID about two months ago, but uh, for some reason, the cough is still with me. So if I do that, then I do apologise. And there's the, the poll results. So 80% of you say, yes, you do make uh, uh, use of the R&D tax incentive. 20% of you don't. And it's probably relatively even all the way across in terms of the changing approach by HMRC, which I think is probably useful for our, uh, our colleagues from uh, um, Forest Brown. And I'm sure that they'll want to talk about that in a bit more detail later. Right, so without any further ado, if I just hand over to uh, Lorelei, who will uh, um, run through uh, the, uh, the, the situation and uh, will include um, conversations by uh, Gareth Randall and Jenny Tragner as well. So Lorelei, over to you. Fantastic, thanks so much Ian. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lorelei and I'm a Senior Manager at Forest Brown. Now we have been working with the ACE for a number of years, so 
Hopefully you'll have heard of us, but if you haven't, we are an R&D tax relief specialist. We focus just on R&D tax relief and helping businesses across all sectors, but specifically in engineering to access the incentive. We are based in Bristol, down in London, up in Scotland, kind of all over the country, servicing businesses across the UK. Um, and we're really proud of our relationship, I think, with the ACE because it's it's been one that's been really fruitful for us. We've worked with lots of member companies across the years, and, and we found it really useful to be able to speak to members in forums like this about really important changes um, that we'll be covering today. I'm really pleased that the, the poll came back and said that lots of businesses aren't aware of HMRC's changing approach because Jenny and Gareth will be talking about that a lot today and we want to make sure that this is useful for you. Um, so without further ado, I'll just introduce you to uh, my fellow panellists, Gareth and Jenny. I'm also on the slides, so I've got lots of jobs today. I need to make sure I don't... There we go. There we all are. <laughs> Perfect. So first up, we've got Jenny Tracker in the middle there. She is a tax director at Boris Brown, and she's also one of the UK's leading R&D policy experts. Now, she is a chartered accountant by trade with over 20 years experience advising businesses, and she's quite experienced advising hundreds of companies across this sector on R&D funding. Kind of away from her desk and away from the office, she also contributes to a number of different groups on the operation of the incentives, uh, policy around R&D, and the future as well of the incentive, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, she recently helped the Chartered Institute of Taxation to publish their guidance um, on the minimum standards for R&D tax advice. Uh, and she's at the moment leading our kind of response to the government's consultation on, on the future of the incentive, which is playing a really important role at the moment at a policy level. So welcome, Jenny. Lovely to have you. Wearing the same top as in the picture. How funny is that? <laughs> I promise I don't only ever dress in this top. <laughs> Do you know, after I had my photo done, I think I threw my green top in the bin because <laughs> it so happened that every time there was a webinar, I'd be wearing it. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, up to you what you do with it. Gareth next. Um, Gareth is a senior sector specialist at Forrest Brown. Um, and Gareth's got over 20 years experience actually in industry as a civil and structural engineer. So he has lots of firsthand experience of what it's like to be on site doing some of these really difficult pieces of work. Um, over at Forrest Brown, Gareth supports our engineering clients in the preparation of their R&D claim. Um, he's got specialist experience helping businesses to correctly identify the boundaries of their R&D and complex projects. We'll tell you a little bit about why that's so important in a moment. So welcome Gareth too. Hi, everybody. Lovely to have you. OK, so next, then, let's take a look at what we've got on the agenda for today. So a lot has a lots of stuff has been really um, changing in the world of R&D recently. So in the first part, we're going to be taking a look at exactly what's happened, what's changed and how that impacts you as a business making use of the incentive. We are then going to be taking a look at HMRC's changing approach um, to customer led R&D and touching on a, a case specifically um, that we recently won. And then in the final part, and this is where we give you all at home some homework and some takeaways, some important takeaways from the webinar, we'll be talking about what you can do as a business to navigate this changing approach that we're seeing from HMRC. Okay, brilliant. Um, as Ian mentioned, if you've got any questions at all as we go, just pop them in the chat box. Really happy to answer them then, or we've also got some dedicated time at the end of the session too. So, before we review what's changed, Jenny, could we just take a minute to remind ourselves actually why the government incentivizes innovation in the first place? Sure. Um, so I saw on the poll a lot of people on the call today are familiar with R&D tax relief. So it's quite, um, it is, there's a good level of awareness and it is quite a generous tax break um, from the government, but also the incentive itself makes good economic sense um, from the government's perspective. And that's actually quite, common economic policy around the world. The aim of R&D tax relief is to encourage businesses to invest more in R&D by lowering the risk, lowering the cost of capital of undertaking that, those innovative activities. Um, and that is because why do governments want to do that? Well, they recognize that successful growing businesses um, help to contribute back to the economy. Um, and HMRC carry out regular research projects to look at the, uh, the effectiveness of R&D tax reliefs. Um, and their research shows that they estimate that um, for every pound that they give away in R&D tax relief, they actually stimulate um, more investment in R&D for the economy. So uh, a sort of virtuous cycle um, of innovation. Fabulous, thank you very much. So we know how the incentive 
benefits us as an economy but what about businesses individually how are they how are they benefiting from the incentive yes so i mentioned that kind of one of the founding um kind of underlying policies of our anti-tax relief is that successful businesses contribute to the economy and hmrc's research recent research actually um showed that or demonstrated the the ways that those um innovative businesses are more successful and um, so they found that um that their turnover is higher but also that they they have they successfully still market share from their less innovative competitors um, and actually investment in r&d benefits geographical Ge geographic communities <laughs> through uh, what's known as knowledge diffusion. So we see this, um, or I mentioned our, our HQ is in Bristol. We've also got really strong innovation hubs there around the creative industries, obviously aerospace and engineering as well. And we see that in different areas of the UK um, where innovation is kind of fostered by geographical area and, and supports communities in that way. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so this is all really good news for established businesses, but of course, younger growing businesses also contribute to the economy and in particular through increasing the number of skilled jobs in the UK, which is great news for the government. Um, Gareth, I know you've seen firsthand the positive impact on the relief. Uh, could you tell us a bit more from your own experience? Yeah, sure. And I think the nice thing is obviously I, I get to speak to, to clients year on year and see what they've been doing with the incentive and, and the money they've generated from that. Um, I've had clients who I've spoken to who have um, created dedicated R&D roles in their company, which is always really good. Um, they've been using that relief to, to fund internal initiatives for technical advances, which have then been additionally claimable via the incentive. So like Jenny was saying, you get that sort of virtuous circle of, of innovation, um, which the incentive was set up for in the first place. Um, I've seen companies using the relief to, to procure some really interesting new cutting edge plants or equipment so they can use that to experiment with on, on new and interesting interesting boundary pushing um, sort of incentives that, uh, that, that they've come up with. Um, I think one that I, that I just spoke to a client about recently, which was really nice, is that um, they're funding, for example, a, a PhD student um, who's doing work on sustainable concrete at a local university. And then they're bringing them in for vacation work where they're actually giving them the opportunity to experiment on a on a real real world live project which um which i thought was really encouraging as well so there's lots of um, good use of things out there fantastic thanks so much gareth right well we know if we've got quite a lot going on this next slide so jenny's going to talk you guys through it but the incentive has been around for over 20 years now um we know that uptake is at an all-time high but that isn't the full picture. Jenny, could you just talk us through briefly what's been going on in the last few years? Sure. Can you just give me a thumbs up that you can still hear me? I've had to ditch my headphones. That we can all hear you. <laughs> the sound of my own voice was echoing in my ears in that last section. And um, those that know me know that I can't stand my own voice on a recording. <laughs> but, no, yeah, yeah, abs <laughs> absolutely. So um, as, as you say, Lorelai, but first of all, the volume of claims that are made each year um, continues to rise. And this is a trend we've seen over a number of years. The last set of statistics that HMRC released were back in um, the autumn last year that showed that more than 80,000 R&D claims are now being made each year. That's obviously driving an overall increase in the cost of the incentive um, to the government. And on the one hand, we could just stop there and say, well, this could be viewed as good news. More R&D claims means more R&D expenditure. Um, so an increase in the volume of claims and the cost of the incentive could be a good thing. But the additional relief at the moment doesn't appear to be driving an increase in the amount of R&D investment that businesses are reporting that they're spending each year. Um, and that disconnect has really, really led to obvious questions about whether the money being spent on R&D tax relief is being well targeted towards genuine R&D investment within the UK. Um, and that for those kind of questions and the, the kind of reaction to that concern has kind of instigated quite a few changes um, to the R&D tax incentive, but also to, to what HMRC has been doing in administering the incentive as well. So the, first, my audio goes a bit funny and now the light has switched off in my room. <laughs> um, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, those, those of you who have accessed R&D tax lease will be aware that the, um, the rate of relief is very generous. Um, and as HMRC moved to, um, to look at things like avoidance schemes and kind of close loopholes in tax and, and kind of simplify and streamline the tax system, what we found over the past couple of years is that R&D tax leave has very much come up on the fraudsters radar as well. 
Um, in 2018, there was actually quite a substantial case of fraud and three people ended up being, ja being jailed for a completely sort of spurious uh, set of transactions where they attempted to claim a really substantial sum. Um, uh, they were caught. Um, as I say, they were, they were also put in jail. Um, outright large scale fraud like that is quite rare. What we're seeing is HMRC are now increasingly focused on what they term to be errors, abuse and boundary pushing within R&D claims um, and looking at the effect that they might have on, on the overall R&D figures. Um, HMRC's latest estimates suggest that around 336 million of the 7.4 billion pounds of R&D tax relief could be awarded each year um, to erroneous claims. Mm -hmm. um, and what do we mean by boundary pushing? Well, um, often when we talk about kind of fraud in R&D claims and we talk about that kind of case of fraud, um, that's a very kind of deliberate criminal proactive um, activity. Um, abuse and boundary pushing we see more in relation to things like potentially dubious R&D projects. Um, so at Forest Brown, we've seen marketing that suggests that things like mixing new cocktails or um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, articles that were suggesting kind of putting in signage for one-way systems in response to COVID could potentially be R&D projects, clearly not really seeking any advance in science or technology. So um, fairly kind of skeptical grounds for an R&D project. Um, or it could be dubious R&D expenditure, so maybe some legitimate R&D being carried out, um, but we've seen examples um, where potentially everyone from the sales director to the cleaner was um, allegedly involved in that R&D. So those are the sorts of activities that HMRC are keeping a really close eye on at the moment, and that they term to be kind of errors, abuse and boundary pushing. Um, and what are they doing about that? Well, that's, it's sort of fueled them into quite a major step change in a lot of areas in terms of their approach. Um, part of that is they've recruited 100 new compliance officers um, and they're focused there within their R&D team and focused on checking and reviewing R&D claims. That's quite the quite a significant increase in resource. Um, we flag on the timeline in front of us uh, the rise in rogue advisors that are setting out really to exploit businesses. To what extent are those advisors themselves driving this rise in error and fraud? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of separate point to, to kind of put into the mix here on the, um, on kind of what the, the environment for R&D tax looks like at the moment. And I mean, to answer your question, Lorelei, unfortunately, we think probably quite substantially, um, particularly around that, the, the concept of kind of boundary pushing, dubious R&D projects, um, maybe inflated claims. At Forest Brown, we've seen a rise in the number of um, spurious advisors in our market. And by spurious, I mean those that, really have no experience or, or, or kind of ex, uh, qualifications or expertise in either tax or R&D tax um, itself. Um, and it often comes as a surprise to the businesses I speak to that pretty much anyone can set up shop as an R&D tax advisor or actually a tax advisor or an accountant. And they don't actually need to have any professional qualifications or relevant experience to do so. Um, and the awareness of that is not, a, um, is not significant out there in the market. And sadly, what that means is the number of businesses that are potentially falling foul of bad advice and then coming up against HMRC's kind of increased compliance resources is on the rise. Um, we've seen a marked increase in cases of negligent advice um, and companies facing inquiry based on kind of being given poor advice, um, certainly in the work that we do to support businesses. Mm -hmm. This is a point that you're really passionate about I think it's quite clear to see how do you think that this is going to be resolved well from my perspective as a member of the, the kind of tax and accounting industry at Forest Brown we're a member of the Chartered Institute of Taxation um, I'm a Chartered Accountant and an ATT member and um, I'm supporting a number of views in, in our industry that um, we should regulate this market um, as I say, a lot of the businesses I speak to assume that it is already a regulated environment and therefore there is some protection when they are engaging with an advisor. Um, that There is a lot of conversation, there is a big conversation going on about whether we should regulate the market. But I think in the meantime, in terms of um, the businesses that we're speaking to today, there's work that can be done to address that lack of awareness um, amongst businesses of the risks associated when they're engaging with an R&D tax advisor and also the due diligence that they should be carrying out in order to make sure that they are, if they're partnering with, uh, with an advisory firm, that they're partnering with someone that they can trust that has the relevant skills, qualifications, experience to, to support them. Um, so I guess if, if 
those on the webinar today leave with just one piece of information it's really that know that when you're buying services from a, an accounting firm or a tax firm or an r d specialist that you're not um the market is not formally regulated um so anyone can call themselves a tax advisor even if they've got no qualifications the the only way that you will know is to ask and to do your due diligence and um, there are very experienced qualified advisors out there that can support you there are a number of them but you do need to ask to make sure that you're partnering with the best. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned earlier on that HMRC has recently decided to hire 100 new compliance staff, but that isn't the only change we're seeing from HMRC. Um, we've seen a real shift in the way that they're interpreting customer-led R&D, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, and also a series of piecemeal measures that have been launched with little fanfare. Jenny, could you elaborate on some of the other trends that we're seeing from HMRC at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I'll just pick out a couple. Something that we've um, we've seen recently that has come out of that estimate that I mentioned of the, the potential level of, level of kind of error and fraud in the figures is that HMRC now selects some R&D claims for, uh, for compliance checks or inquiries at random. Um, and so rather than reviewing documentation and, and potentially identifying a risk and, and asking questions about that, what we're seeing is randomly selected um, claims with sort of broad, quite general questions um, about the claim, just to check if every aspect is okay. So these can result in quite long standardized lists of questions. Um, uh, and they can sometimes be quite relatively time consuming to respond to. And that is to kind of kick the tires and, and test every aspect. If they find any errors, um, then they will investigate those. We're seeing them use their, their powers of penalties and discovery notice. Um, anyone not familiar with HMRC, a discovery notice is where they potentially look back at earlier tax returns for earlier claims that they've made. Um, and I mentioned that they bolted their, their compliance team, but just to put those numbers into some um, context, prior to 2020, they had a team of between 20 and 30 R&D tax specialists, so not engineers, um, tax tax people, tax inspectors, um, but specialising just in looking at R&D claims. So from 20 to 30 up to kind of over 100 is, is a real substantial increase um, to, that, to that team and a much kind of sharper focus on um, checking claims and challenging them where necessary. Absolutely. So it's fair to say then that we're expecting a lot more inquiries as a result? Yeah, I mean, uh, your, your average caseworker at HMRC can probably handle 20 to 30 cases at once. So kind of the, the yeah. very simple answer to that is, is yes, that gives them the resource to be checking more claims, to be running more inquiry processes. Um, and we have seen that kind of across the board. Um, and as I've said, we've seen a change in, in approach to inquiries. Um, so potentially kind of a more standardised approach. But what I would say is where companies have been able to respond in a timely fashion, clearly and in detail to the questions raised, um, it's still very much possible to, to resolve an inquiry relatively quickly. And bear in mind that with HMRC, we're talking sort of um, probably 30 days um, for them to write you a letter um, and then they'll give you 30 days to respond. So uh, we're typically talking kind of weeks, probably months to resolve an inquiry. Um, but if you've got all the information up front, if you understand the types of um, detail and evidence they might look for, and that's all ready, when the inquiry comes, it shouldn't be too much of a time drain and it should, shouldn't be too overly concerning because you'll have all that data ready. It's definitely worth taking the time to walk them through your information, particularly when it comes to things like describing your R&D project. Um, we've seen that kind of change in approach in part, putting the onus much more on the business to be able to describe their R&D projects in a, in a way that HMRC kind of can understand and be satisfied that, that the claim has been diligently prepared. Fantastic, thank you so much. Now then, we've taken a bit of time to look back at the events that have led us to now. So why don't we take a moment to kind of look to the future of the incentive. We know at Forest Brown that 2021 was a very busy year for R&D tax relief. In the March budget, the Chancellor launched the most wide-reaching review of the incentive since it was introduced back in 2000. Jenny, could you tell us a bit more about the consultation and why it's important to members of ACE? Yeah, sure. So, um, as I said, it kicked off, so the consultation kicked off in March last year, and it's really the first time since the incentive was introduced back in um, 2000 that we've kind of stopped and really looked at whether there's scope to reform or undertake kind of full intensive review. Um, the consultation 
potentially puts kind of change to any aspect of the relief on the table. Um, everything from the definition of R&D, so the types of projects that we reward um, with relief, the nature uh, of the costs that get relief, so the types of expenditure that you can get relief for, um, to a lot of kind of options and questions around the mechanism for relief and, and kind of how it's administered um, and how we ensure that it continues to kind of do what we want it to do. So it signals really the part of uh, the start of um, what I think will be a few years worth of change for R&D tax incentives. And um, there are lots of stakeholders involved. You can see a number of them um, that, that we've kind of worked with so far that have, um, that have structured responses to, to the consultation so far. It's being run jointly by Treasury and by HMRC because it's so broad, as I say, it looks at not just changes to the incentive itself, but also changes to the way that, um, that it's administered. Um, so I guess, how, why is that relevant to, to ACE members? If you are one of those 80% um, that are claiming R&D tax relief each year, um, it's really vital that you're up to date on changes to the rules. It's just to be aware that, that there are changes coming in um, to some of the rules governing R&D, which we'll touch on in a moment. Um, but also, I think with so much attention on R&D tax at the moment, and um, with so much activity and change going on within HMRC, now is a really good time to be reflecting on your approach to your R&D tax relief claims. Um, so if you've been kind of quite comfortable with your methodology and your approach and, um, and you've not kind of checked that, as I say, kick the tires for a few years, now might be a good time just to, just to check that it's still aligned with how HMRC are behaving at the moment. And of course, if you're particularly interested in, in R&D tax relief and the, the impact that it's had on your business, it's an opportunity for you to get involved in responding to the consultation. So it's open to, um, to anyone who's interested to, to put in recommendations. Um, and I would recommend any businesses that feel kind of particularly passionate about any aspect of R&D tax relief um, to, to write in and contribute and be part of the conversation because change is happening and this is an opportunity to inform that for, for the better. Fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Um, more recently, the autumn budget and the spring statement, R&D investment received still a lot of airtime. Gareth, as a sector specialist, could you tell us a little bit about some of the recent changes that were announced and how they impact and could impact um, members of ACE? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think really there's, there's two key things to be aware of. Um, the first one's on the software development side of things, which is perhaps a bit less relevant, but essentially to, to some matter, they are updating the definition of software expenditure to include data and cloud costs. So this, um, this measure was specifically consulted on previously and was widely supported and, and really should be positively received for, for those of you that are, that are using that. But I think really particular re relevance to, to you guys is the, the big one to watch out for is that, um, and especially if you're a multinational or, or make heavy use of offshoring, is that the relief is going to be restricted or removed for R&D activities by parties outside of the UK even though the cost sector is in the UK. So if you're driving an R&D project from the UK, but are relying on overseas regional hubs or overseas specialists, then those are gonna be off the table, unfortunately, as, as things currently stand. But um, um, maybe without doom, doom mongering a bit too much, I'm Jenny, you, maybe if I can bring you in on that, this one, you mentioned to me that there's perhaps a glimmer of hope on this one, perhaps? Yeah, so we had um, we had some further comments at the spring statement this year that do suggest that um, that government has listened to representations from industry in particular, um, and will look to protect some of those businesses where it's it's necessary to carry out um, R and D overseas. Um, so the the big debate I think during the consultation was um, was around the necessity due to skills shortage shortages. I'm sure everyone on the webinar today will will have some experience of the impact of the, the current kind of skills shortages across a vast array of, um, of different industry sectors. But certainly the, the, the engineering disciplines are very well represented on those skills, short, skills shortage lists. Um, but also kind of the practicalities of if your site is overseas and then R&D has to take place overseas, if there's a regulatory reason that R&D has to take place overseas. Um, we're hoping and we, we await the, the kind of detail around it, but we're hoping some protections will be built in to those new regulations. Um, so we think that they will, they will still come in, but we're hoping that there will be some exclusions and we wait to see the detail of those, um, hopefully in the summer. Thanks, Great. Thanks guys. Um, so Jenny, really quickly before we move into the next section, do we have any idea of what we can expect from this year's autumn budget? 
crystal ball time. Um, and yeah. well, that's what I guess between yeah. now and the autumn, we should get the detail of um, the rules governing the data and cloud costs and the overseas R&D. So we'll know a lot more, we'll be in a much better position to be able to advise businesses on the potential impact um, of those measures. Um, there are also, as it says on the slide, there, there are a number of um, changes on the horizon which are targeted at tackling abuse of the system, and they are mainly around the way in which R&D claims are submitted to HMRC and the data that's provided to HMRC that, um, that they can hold in their system to give them um, better data to be able to, um, to target compliance activities. But there are also a number of items that were raised in the initial consultation report that haven't yet been addressed in the subsequent discussions in, in any detail. And they include um, proposals to potentially move away from the current mechanism by which SMEs receive relief, so the super deduction and the surrender of losses for a tax credit onto a model that's, um, or potentially the same model as large companies claim. So the R&D expenditure credit model, which is a flat um, tax credit, um, which sort of reduces tax liability or in, after certain steps can be um, payable in cash for non-taxpayers. Um, whether that would retain the, the far more generous rate of relief for SMEs um, is, a, is a question to be answered. But um, if I was going to predict, I would expect something around whether that, that move is on the horizon in the future. Um, just quickly, other points, um, there were questions around relief really for capital expenditure on R&D. Obviously, we saw the super deduction um, come in. Um, that is due to expire next year, but there are questions around whether we should be kind of making more incentive, delivering more incentive for CapEx um, on R&D. Um, there was also talk around projects with specific social value. So how can R&D tax be better help us achieve net zero aims? Um, and should we be rewarding those projects in a different way? Um, I'm hoping to see some movement on discussion around regulation of the tax industry as well. Um, so I guess, Watch this space. Um, I think it's going to be a very busy second half of the year um, for r and tax. Fantastic. Thank you. Right then. So let's oh, move to... Should we pick up? We've just got a question in from um, oh, yeah. from Andrew on that. I'm happy to kind of field yeah, the point on part should two. We, we um, just read that out for the audience. Yep. Yeah, so what is the date when, under the current plan, the overseas R&D cannot be considered? So at the moment, the proposal is due to be introduced from April 2023. Um, and one of the um, one of the bits of information that, that we should get um, in the summer is what that means, whether that's for expenditure incurred on or after the 1st of April 23, or it could be for accounting period beginning on or after 1st of April 23. So there are there are a couple of kind of options for when they bring that in. And we'll know that when we get the draft legislation, um, hopefully this summer. Fantastic. Um, if, ah, oh, lovely. Um, so let's move on to part two. I am going to do a quick time check, guys. We've got, I think, 10 more minutes to get through part two and three. So it's going to be a whistle stop tour of the tribunal victory that we're going to talk about. If I very briefly just summarise what happened, and then Jenny, I can hand over to you as one of the people on the team who secured the benefit for Quinn. Um, so last year, we had a really exciting significant tribunal victory against HMRC. Um, essentially, they had taken the view that R&D carried out to deliver a product to a client um, is subsidised, and subsidised expenditure isn't eligible for SME R&D tax relief. Now, the result of this position is that businesses have been denied significant amounts of funding, which Jenny will talk about in a moment, um, but all is not lost. We, in October last year, secured a victory against HMRC on this point in a case against our um, client, Quinn London. Jenny, could you talk to us a little bit more about what actually happened in the case? Yeah, and um, conscious of your time check, Laurel, I probably really? could talk about the uh, Quinn case for, for longer than you want me to. So I will try <laughs> to cover it in, um, in a nutshell. If anyone on the webinar is interested in talking separately, particularly about the case and the implications for your business. And um, Gareth, Laurel, and I are very happy to do that. Um, but as I say, in a, in a nutshell, as Laurel, I said, the, the case came about because um, we'd supported Quinn London with um, preparing some R&D claims. HMRC had inquired into those claims. Um, they'd accepted the R&D and the R&D expenditure, um, but they'd challenged um, their eligibility to claim SME relief um, and if essentially closed the inquiry, denying them access to the relief. Um, Quinn's a construction company. They have a specialist heritage division, um, and most of their R&D projects are carried out to deliver work for clients, like 
I would expect would be the case for most engineering, if not all engineering consultancies who are, who are kind of carrying out R&D. Uh, Quinn prides itself on its reputation for being able to tackle the most complex um, projects, particularly in the heritage sector. sector. It views its investment in R&D as, as really kind of critical for maintaining that reputation um, and its competitive edge in the market. Um, R&D, of course, presents risk to it, um, reputational risk that it won't be able to, to deliver on what it's promised to clients, um, financial risk in that they'll suffer delays or um, kind of overruns in, in costs. Um, but they view those new techniques and materials and methods that they develop in those projects. And they, as I say, they help to give, keep that competitive edge to give them um, kind of success in future projects and competitions for future projects. So it's that. It's really that incentive effect that, from my perspective, goes to the heart of the policy for R&D tax relief. Um, it's something that, as an R&D tax relief advisor, I feel that's been well understood um, since the inception of, um, of the incentive. But in this case, uh, HMRC decided that they didn't feel like it was fair that the R&D in question formed part of a client project. Um, so essentially where the client was paying for the work delivered. And therefore, in most, although notably not all of the cases, the price that those clients paid covered Quinn's investment in the R&D um, that related to the project. And then, um, as Laurel, I mentioned, they use a piece of legislation that prevents a company from claiming SME relief if it receives a subsidy towards its R&D. They were saying that the price paid by clients represented a subsidy for the underlying R&D. And I actually put like that, um, a lot of people might be sitting there thinking, all right, maybe they've got a point. Um, HMRC said, how can it be fair that Quinn's clients are covering most of this R&D expenditure when you compare that to a company who's perhaps undertaking completely speculative blue sky R&D um, and might not be able to recoup those costs commercially. Um, but if you really do sit and think that through, and I've done that several times over the past couple of years um, during and, and after this case, it really presents an entirely illogical view of how R&D works in a commercial context. Remembering, of course, that R&D tax relief is targeted to businesses as corporation tax relief. Um, so it needs to be viewed through the lens of how companies carry out R&D to further their commercial activities. Um, and I am pleased to say that the judge agreed with us and, and with our client, and they overturned HMRC's decision and ultimately awarded Quinn the full amount of, um, of SME R&D relief. Fantastic. Why is it that this case is, is quite so significant? Um, well, I guess, first off, it's relatively rare for a company to win. Um, so out of, I think there's, there, there's been an, a new case since then, but out of 12 cases, you can see there's four there um, that have been wins for the taxpayer. Um, we've actually seen a, a spate of recent cases dealing with um, R&D tax relief claims that uh, can be kind of ca characterised as just simply quite poorly prepared claims um, where the tribunal has found Kind of the, the underlying basis for there being any R&D or R&D expenditure really quite lacking. Um, it is important to note that, that the Quinn case hasn't um, unfortunately resolved the issue conclusively. It is one case and it's obviously it's relevant to, to Quinn's facts, um, but it does provide us with a lot of additional clarity on how the law should be interpreted. That gives much greater certainty for us as tax advisors and, and kind of the wider tax advice market but also the businesses that are accessing um, R&D tax relief at a time where we certainly feel that there's a, there's a definite lack of certainty and clarity coming out of HMRC around this point. Um, much to our frustration, um, HMRC has decided not to appeal the decision, but they have said that they disagree with it um, and that it's not changed their position on subsidised expenditure. So we are still seeing cases where they are challenging circumstances similar to Quinn for client R&D projects and saying that that R&D expenditure is subsidised. Um, it's not the end of the story. Um, as I said, it's kind of part of my prediction that, that the next six to 12 months will be a busy time for, for R&D tax relief. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Gareth, as an expert with industry experience uh, in engineering, could you explain quickly the potential ramifications for, for businesses uh, in, in the membership? I guess uh, no, really to, to um, reinforce what Jenny was saying. I mean, the, again, the unfortunate um, implication, well, the, the, the consequence of what, what they've come up with, we thought HMRC would um, take, to, you know, take the, the point of agreement, but what they've actually done is they, they still they haven't changed their position on, on how they view subsidized expenditure. Um, and in fact, they've actually updated their guidance to reflect this contradictory position. Um, and, and obviously, you know, 
yes, fraud and error are on the rise, and they're under pressure to ensure that the obviously taxpayers' money is, is being well spent, and that's 100 percent the right thing to approach, and, and, and you should be supporting that effort. But um, if you think about it again, so similar to what Jenny was saying, given that most commercial projects are going to be ultimately time funded, um, HMRC's focus on subsidized expenditure and subcontracted RD seems to be a bit of a mis guided or misjudged uh, part of this effort and, and it's not really in keeping with the spirit of the whole incentive. So, so really, uh, I guess our advice really to, to any SMEs in the audience um, undertaking client aid R&D, which will be most of you, is really just to make sure that you're working with uh, an R&D specialist with an expert understanding of what the rules are. And, and um, I think wrapping things up, which I'm, I'm aware that we are running out of time, but we'll try and offer you a couple of tips um, on, on a few things that um, you can keep your eye on and just be aware of um, as you're claiming going forward. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gareth. Now, just to reassure Chetna and everybody in the audience, this final part of the webinar, part three, where we give you some practical recommendations, we will do a quick fire version of. And as Jenny said earlier on, if you do have a question about any of these points, or about Quinn, or about how, how the landscape's changing so much, just we are very happy to chat afterwards. But why don't we do a quick fire round? Jenny, kicks off with point number one. What yeah. Are we well, this is all about Quinn, and um, so that case involved their commercial contracts with their clients and whether they amounted to um, an agreement to, for one party to subsidise the other. So it's never been more important to understand how those contracts that you have with company, with your clients might affect your R&D claim. So it's become a um, much more significant part of the work that we do for our clients is reviewing those contracts and understanding any potential impact. Fantastic, thank you. And Gareth, let's swing number two over to you. Yeah, uh, being pragmatic about your approach to risk. Yeah, so I mean, as, as an engineer, I'd love, it, I'd love it if it was all black and white and you knew this is exactly going to be a, a winning um, case for R&D and this not. But unfortunately, because there's a lot of gray in this, there is potential for HMRC to challenge your claim and, and potentially disagree with the position that you've taken. And that's just what it is. So you know, HMRC and, and, and the way they view things in terms of R&D tax relief um, will involve you and your advisor making judgment calls and, and being um, advised of potential risks of where they could challenge your claim. So it's just important to know, sorry, my line's not gone as well, but um, it's important to know that, you know, that yes, there could be a counter argument and just to be aware of that. And I think that's a big point to make, you know, be aware of what the challenges could be, be informed when you're making these claims um, and um, obviously speak with your clients and, and work transparently to actually identify those potential risks and manage them accordingly. Fantastic. Number three, kind of pretty much covered the tin. <laughs> pretty much covered there um, by what Gareth said. So that approach to risk will flex depending on what HMRC are focusing on, their working practices. Um, and you know, hopefully you've heard today in today's webinar that that their their approach to RD is changing. It has changed, it will continue to change. Fantastic, thank you. Um, get to know your R&D claim. Gareth, what do we mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you'd be shocked. I mean, we, we have our advisory practice at, uh, at Forest Brown who are regularly approached by the business facing inquiry because their advisor had submitted information that isn't correct. Um, and unfortunately, because the respective businesses hadn't understood the detail of their claim, they just blindly sent the claim off with no idea of the errors that were present until HMRC came back to them with questions. So um, just be aware that uh, you know, there are these risks and make sure that when you're preparing your claim, you take the time to, to do the due diligence on things and, and make sure that you're happy with, with what's going on. You understand why it's R&D, you understand what the contents are and, um, and that you're fully involved with the whole process. And as I mentioned earlier, that the whole process is being transparent between yourselves and, and your advisor, just to make sure you know what's going out to, to HMRC. Fantastic, thank you. And Jenny, just to close there, partnering with a regulated advisor, we've touched on it throughout, but why is it so important? Yeah, I touched on it earlier. The, the regulatory framework in the tax and accounting market is complicated. Um, so I would encourage um, everyone working with a partner to ask um, a properly qualified um, experienced advisor will be absolutely delighted to explain um, what their, their, how their, their regulation informs their behaviour and how that protects you as their client. 
Fantastic, thank you. Um, we do have one or two questions. I wonder if we're going to be cut off, but let's give them a go. Before we do, though, um, I just want to leave you all with one recommendation. The landscape, hopefully you've got a sense that the landscape for R&D tax relief is, is changing quite a lot. So it's, I think the office is closing down at Forest Brown. Um, so I think it's really important and more important than ever that you are seeking expert advice if you are accessing this incentive. Certainly the message is not to wait until HMRC investigates. Being proactive and taking steps now to ensure your approach is in line with what is accepted is what we really strongly recommend. Um, if you would like any more information about what we've covered, or you just want to, to speak about any of the points that we've mentioned, um, Gareth, Jenny or I are always really happy to have a chat. Uh, the details are on the slide in front of us. Now, I am just going to quickly open the floor for a couple of questions, if anyone has one. Um, one that I've just had come in, do you think we'll see more cases like Quinn? Maybe Jenny, do you want to take that? Yes. I'd love to say that um, post Quinn we'll all get around the table with, with HMRC and we'll reach an agreement and, and we'll find some certainty and move forward for businesses. It doesn't seem to be the likely um, eventuality. I think more litigation is, is inevitable. So watch this space. I'm sure we'll be back on a webinar near you sometime soon. Thank you. And maybe we've just got one more that we can finish off with. It's an important point. How can a business actually check that their partner is regulated? How can they find that out? Yeah. Um, as I say, it's not that easy. It's fairly complicated framework for, um, for kind of membership of professional bodies in, um, in the tax market. So um, as I say, I would ask um, if you're not sure, if it's not clear, um, I would ask your advisor um, whether they are a regulated or a member of a professional body. Those that are will be absolutely delighted to explain to you. Um, the accountancy industry isn't, um, we're not typically very good at talking about um, kind of the qualifications and, um, uh, and the expertise that we have, um, I, I think. So do ask your advisor. I think if everyone goes away with one piece of homework today, um, I think it's that. Make sure. Fantastic. Um, I think all that's left from our side is to thank Ian and the team so much for, for giving us the chance to chat to everyone today. Um, really appreciate it. And to members coming to join to, to hear what we have to talk about, thanks for taking the time out of your day. Okay, thanks, Lorelei. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I think that uh, there are a number of, probably a number of follow-up questions and thoughts that uh, that people who have tuned in uh, will want to know about. And I'm sure that they'll either re- look at the uh, recording of uh, the webinar, or if you've got any other questions, then feel free to obviously get in touch with uh, Jenny Direct, or alternatively, if you go to the AC website and or you want to contact us at AC straight away, then uh, feel free to do that and we'll pass on uh, uh, the relevant information to you. So many thanks for listening. I hope you found it interesting and I hope that you are able to glean the right sort of information that you want for your claims uh, going forward. So thanks for Gareth Randall, Jenny Tragner, and also Lorelei Chapman Ludgate. And we thank you all for your time. Don't forget, by the way, just a little reminder that you will be able to get this uh, off our website in the next uh, couple of days or so, anyway, the recording. So hopefully you'll uh, grab that and, uh, and look at other stuff as well. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye.